open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 14 as we continue our study through the book of Romans called The Gospel for Christians. And then, as you know, the title of our studies from chapter 12 through chapter 15 and verse 13 is All Give Some and Some Give All, as Paul is instructing the Roman believers regarding the subject of Christian service. In this section, as you know, Paul calls on all of us as believers to become living, giving, loving, yielding, and now willing sacrifices in order to serve our Lord and others in a biblical and God-honoring way. Now today, as we begin our study, or we will begin our study today, let me have another run at that if I could, sorry. I'm trying to go ahead of myself here. Today, we begin our study in of the... F- <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I am thrown off this morning. I'm so... Uh, you know. Anyway, we're uh, in Romans 14. You're there, right? Okay, good. <laughs> oh, so anyway, all right, that's not helping, Dwayne. Here we go. <laughs> Today, we begin our study of the final portion of this section. And as you know, the section we're looking at right now is Romans chapters 12 through verse 13 of chapter 15. And so we're now in the final portion of this section of Romans as Paul now deals with the uncomfortable subject of differences within the church. Beginning here in chapter 14 through verse 13 of the next chapter, Paul encourages all of us to become willing sacrifices so that we may glorify God by loving and serving God one another. Our outline for the remainder of this section is very simple. In verses 1 through 13, or at least the first part of verse 13, here in chapter 14, Paul exhorts us to put up with one another. And then beginning in the second half of verse 13, through verse 13 of the next chapter, chapter 15, Paul exhorts us all to give up for one another. So right now we're looking at the issue of putting up with one another. And then in the next portion of this last section that we're looking at here, um, he's going to be talking about, in the, after we get through today's study, um, then th- from chapter 14, second half of verse 13, on through verse 13 of chapter 15, he's going to be, he's, he's exhorting us to give up something to give be willing to give up for one another so he's dealing with the issue of being willing sacrifices are we good yep. rob's good is everybody else good all right i just feel really weird right now i feel real uncomfortable i don't know why i just feel kind of like all right so anyway a church bulletin mistakenly contained the following announcement The church will host an evening of fine dining, superb entertainment, and gracious hostility. (laughs) It was supposed to say hospitality. And though that was a church bulletin blooper in our day, sad to say, it it, it was a reality in the church in Rome in Paul's day. Because the church at Rome consisted of both Jews and Gentiles, there there was some hostility among them due to Religious and cultural differences. And what differences would those be? Well, though I'm sure there were a few more than what Paul listed for us here in Romans 14, the two differences that Paul did deal with in this letter that were causing a lot of consternation among them was that of special diets and special days. So let's look first of all at the first difference between the believers in Rome, which was that of special diets. Look at verses 2 and 3 in your Bible. Paul writes and says, For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Now, Paul's not saying that if you're a vegetarian, you're weak, though you might be a little weaker if you don't take any protein in. He's not gouging 
vegans, or he's not gouging vegetarians here. You'll see that as we go on. In verse 3, he says, Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. Any questions? We'll just open up for questions right now. Is that no? A kindergarten teacher gave her class a show and tell assignment. Each student was instructed to bring in an object to share with the class that represented their religious beliefs and their religion. The first student got up in front of the class and said, My name is Benjamin and I am Jewish and this is a Star of David. The second student got up in front of the class and said, My name is Mary and I'm Catholic and this is a crucifix. The third student got up in front of the class and said, My name is Tommy and I'm a Baptist and this is a casserole. <laughs> Just like today, food was an important part of the fellowship in the early church. If you read the book of Acts, it tells us that the early church was going from house to house, breaking bread and sharing their meals together. And nothing's changed over 2,000 years. A lot of fellowship happens around food. But because of the differences between the diets of the Jews and the Gentiles, issues arose that threatened to divide the church. There was a controversy in the church boiling over whether Christians ought to eat meat or not. And why? Well, in the Greco-Roman world in which they lived, there were many pagan temples to various gods, and the way that the people would gain the God's favor was by actually offering a meat sacrifice to the idol of the deity, but only a portion of the meat was burned up in the sacrifice. The leftover meat would then be sold for public consumption in the marketplace. And that's where the problem lied. Gentile believers who came out of that pagan background believed Christians should never eat meat that had been offered to an idol, while others contended that since the idols are nothing, and they're nothing but wood and stone and metal, there's nothing wrong with eating the meat. In fact, by this time, Paul had also, or I'm sorry, by this time, Paul had already written to the church in Corinth addressing this same problem in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 10. There were also Gentiles in the church at Rome who practiced asceticism. Now, what's asceticism? That's the custom of self-discipline and abstinence from all forms of indulgence, which included food. The Greek and Roman cultures were so decadent that even non-Christians tried to purify themselves. So they voluntarily refrained from such indulgences such as eating meat, drinking wine, and indulging in any pleasurable activities in order to make themselves more holy, so they thought. Once they became Christians, these people actually brought that asceticism into their Christian lives. And that's why Paul mentions the drinking of wine down in verse 21 of this chapter, if you look at it and see there. And then there were the Jewish believers who also believed that eating certain meats was wrong because you couldn't eat these meats because they were not kosher or they were unclean. Uh, for a Jew to consider a meat clean, there could only be certain animals a Jew could eat according to the law. And then that animal had to actually be put to death and that meat had to be butchered in such a way, in a kosher way, actually by a rabbi, or they would consider it to be unclean. So both the Jewish and Gentile believers were bringing their religious and their cultural dietary restrictions into the church, and it was causing disunity among them, as you can imagine. So here's the question. Which group was right? Well, Jesus gave us the answer. When he dealt with this same subject in Mark chapter 7, verse 15, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said very plainly, it's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. See? In other words, eating or not eating certain foods 
is not a spiritual issue, guys. Okay? It doesn't make a man right before God. So you are free to eat meat or you are free to abstain from eating it. It's up to you. And it's up to every individual Christian. The other point of contention that Paul deals with is, was that of special days. Drop down with me to verse 5. Look at your Bibles in verse 5. Paul writes and says, One person esteems one day above another, and another esteems every day alike. Now, many commentators believe Paul was referring here to the Sabbath day. The Jews worshipped on the Sabbath, as you know, from sundown Friday to sundown on Saturday. And they had all kinds of restrictions about what you could and could not do on the Sabbath. Now, it's clear from the New Testament that by this time, the church was already gathering together for worship on the first day of the week, not the Sabbath, not the seventh day, but the first day of the week, which was Sunday, in order to commemorate the resurrection of Jesus. Perhaps the controversy concerning days had to do with which day of the week was more appropriate for corporate worship and what activities could a Christian take part in on that day. Does any of that sound familiar? Some of you who were raised in church, I'm sure some of this, at least this part, sounds familiar. See, there are Christian groups that still to this day argue whether the church should meet for worship on Saturday or Sunday. In fact, the Seventh-day Adventist church used to believe, they don't so much anymore, but used to believe that if you worshiped God on Sunday and gathered together on Sunday, that you were actually taking part in the mark of the beast. So this issue still exists today. Should we worship together as a church on Saturday or Sunday? And there's still issues about what Christians are allowed or not allowed to do on that day. As you notice, our culture is moving more away from Sunday being sacred, but it used to be where Christians believed it was wrong to go out to eat on Sunday, it was wrong to shop on Sunday, it was wrong to do any business on Sunday, because that's the Lord's day, and that's the day you worship the Lord. Some people still have certain restrictions upon themselves and concerning what they can do on Sunday as Christians, but that issue is kind of fading by the wayside as our culture um, <laughs> moves away from the Bible. But you know what? Paul may also have been referring not to just the Sabbath day here, but to the keeping of certain Jewish feasts. In fact, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Paul wrote this. He said, So let no one judge you in food and in drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths. What's that? What's a festival, a new moon, or Sabbath? It's special days that the Israelites did special things in order to worship God. But Paul went on in verse 17 to say this. These things are just a shadow of things to come. But the substance, the whole point of them, is Christ. Listen, all the prescribed days of worship and feasts back in the law were merely a shadow pointing the people toward the Messiah to come, toward Jesus Christ. Now that Jesus, the substance of those things, has come, why would you ever go back and worship the shadow, see? Yet some Jews, though they were Christians, did, and it caused a stir in the church. So, with such differences between the Christians in Rome, how were they to ever get along with one another? How could they maintain unity when they were so divided about such things? Well, Paul gives the Roman believers some important principles for them to practice in verses 1 through 13, and those principles still apply to us as Christians today. Let's look at them. The first principle is found in verse 1, and it's this. As Christians, fellowshipping together in a local fellowship, we must be willing to accept one another. We must be willing to accept one another. Look at verse 1. Paul writes, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Here in Romans chapter 14 and 15, Paul describes two types of Christians. 
those who are weak in the faith and those who are strong in the faith. In fact, in the next chapter, in verse 1, Paul says this, We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. Thus, here in that verse, Paul was identifying himself with those in the church who were strong in the faith. But what does it mean to be weak in the faith? Because when you hear that, the first thing you should do as you're hearing a Bible study is go, well, which one am I? Am I weak in the faith or am I strong in the faith? Well, what's it mean to be weak in the faith? What's Paul talking about? Well, it refers to those believers who have not yet grasped the doctrine of grace to the point where their conscience is free from external rules and regulations. In fact, one Greek scholar and Scot a Scottish theologian by the name of James Denny described the weak Christian this way, and I want you to listen because it's a good description. He says, and I quote, The weakness is weakness in respect of faith. The weak man is one who does not fully appreciate what his Christianity means. In particular, he does not see that the soul which has been committed, I'm sorry, the soul which has committed itself to Christ for salvation is actually emancipated from all law, but that which is involved in its responsibility to him. Hence, his conscience is fettered by scruples in regard to customs dating from pre-Christian days. In other words, listen, the weak believer is really a spiritually immature believer, regardless of their physical age, or their spiritual age. Just because you're old or older in the faith doesn't really mean you're mature. <laughs> See? What's interesting is this. When it comes to the weak believer, they're really, an they're really a spiritually immature believer. Even though his rigid lifestyle may appear more spiritual than others, his adherence to his own standards is necessary for his own peace of mind. Rather than growing in grace, the weak Christian grapples with grace. Rather than resting in truths such as Romans 5.1. Do you guys know Romans 5.1? It says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He grapples with scriptures like this, Romans 8.1. You guys know that one, right? There is therefore now what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But see, instead of resting in truths like that, the weak Christian is still relying on the thou shouts and the thou shall nots. Rather than trusting the blood of Christ for a clean conscience, he still somewhat relies on his own blood, sweat, and tears. And because of his commitment to keep his conscience clear, he has a tendency to impose his own standards and his own interpretation of Scripture upon others, and then he becomes very judgmental when they don't comply or agree with him. He can be harsh, legalistic, and just plain hard to get along with. That's the weaker brother that Paul is speaking about here. See? But still, even with all of that, Paul warns us not to make spiritual maturity a requirement for fellowship. Amen. Notice how Paul says he's to be treated. Look at verse 1 again. Paul says what? Receive one who is weak in the faith. The word receive here literally means to welcome. It also means to accept. Though the weaker brother is sometimes difficult to deal with, make no mistake about it. He is still a Christian nonetheless and should be welcomed and accepted into the church by his stronger and more mature brothers and sisters. Now, before we move on, let me give you a word of caution as you sit here and you hear this, 
be careful not to categorize yourself too quickly as a strong or weak Christian. You know why? Because oftentimes believers are weak in one area while they're strong in another. Okay? So guys, as we go through this, just remember when it comes to yourself and you're looking at yourself here, remember Paul's words in Romans 12, 3. Paul said, I give you each this warning. Or I'm sorry, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given you. So be careful if you sit here this morning and go, yeah, well, I'm a strong Christian. I'm not like that weak guy. Or you think, wow, I don't think I'm strong at all. Just be careful because all of us are, strength, are strong and weak in some areas of our life. But why should the weaker be received by the stronger? Because of one reason. God has received him. Amen. Look at verse 3. Let him who eats, that's the stronger, despise not him who does not eat, that's the weaker. Let him who does not eat, that's the weaker, judge him who eats, that's the stronger. Why? For God has received him. God's received who? Both, the weak and the strong. That's Paul's point. So if God receives a brother, who are we to reject him? Because he's not like us. Or he doesn't agree with us completely. Or he has different ideas about some things that we do. That should have nothing to do with it. Accept him because God has accepted him. And in the next chapter, Paul gives us the basis for why, we sh why he should be received. Why should we receive the, the weaker brother? Paul says this in verse 7 of chapter 15. Therefore, listen, receive one another. Why? He says this, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Did not God lovingly and willingly receive you when you called out to him with your mess yep. and with your messed up thinking? Absolutely. Well, then when God receives someone else in whom we don't agree with, why do we reject them? Paul's saying don't do that. Listen, if Christ received us, who are us, who are we to reject a brother who wants to fellowship with us? Amen. You see that? And not only should the weaker brother be received, but listen, he should be received wholeheartedly as he is without any intention on our part to change him. Amen. It shouldn't be like Oh, yeah, come on into our fellowship. Be part of our church. Yeah, you got some messed up ideas, but we'll fix you. <laughs> Paul says don't do that. Look at the first one again. Paul says, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Do you see that? Now, you may say, what does that mean? What's the last part of that verse means? Well, it's helpful if you read this verse in other translations. For instance, let me read it for you. If you have the NIV, it reads this way. Except those, I'm sorry, except the one whose faith, who, I'm sorry, let me read that again. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over dispute, bis, disputable matters. Man, you need to pray for me today. I'm having a hard time talking. Let me read it again. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. The ESV reads this way. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but do not, I'm sorry, but not to quarrel over opinions. The NASB says, now accept the one who is weak in faith, now listen to this, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. But if the weak Christian can be uneasy in his conscience and legalistic in his opinions and his behavior, hey, why shouldn't the stronger believer straighten him out? 
I mean, if he's that messed up, why shouldn't we who are strong straighten him out? Well, here's the reason. The reason is the issues that he's legalistic about have nothing to do with salvation. We're not talking here about salvation issues. Paul's talking about secondary issues. These are not matters of sin, but they're matters of conscience. In other words, what Paul's dealing with here in the church of Rome between the Jews and the Gentiles, these are gray areas, not black and white issues like adultery, sexual immorality, drunkenness, or theft. These are issues that only deal, I'm sorry, these are issues that are only dealt with in the scripture by principle, not by book, chapter, and verse. Do you understand that? Listen, the Bible deals with every issue that you will deal with as a Christian, but it doesn't deal with every issue, book, chapter, and verse. What the Bible doesn't deal with and address in book, chapter, and verse, it does deal with in principle. And that's important to understand. And when it comes to gray areas, these are areas that are addressed in Scripture by principle, not book, chapter, and verse. These are areas, guys, about which Christians disagree. They did in the early church in Rome. And guess what? The church still disagrees about these same, a lot of the uh, uh, different, uh, different areas, but there are, this, there are gray areas that the church still grapples with among themselves today. Let me give you some of these areas. The issue of parenting. The issue of parenting. Should we educate our children in public school, private school, or home school? Among this church, there are different opinions. But which, which one is right? The Bible doesn't deal with that book, chapter, and verse. There may be principles about it, but every one of you parents have to make up your own mind what you feel is best for your kids. It's not nobody else's decision. Then there's the issue of personal behavior. Listen, some Christians enjoy a glass of wine with their dinner, while some even have a beer after a long day's work. You know, some Christians chew tobacco and others smoke cigarettes. And you know, there are some Christians who say these behaviors are sinful and they're wrong. Hmm. What about personal appearance? Some Christians have tattoos. And for some other Christians, that bothers them. That they can mark their body up like that. Some Christian men have long hair and earrings. Or short hair and earrings. Some Christians have a problem with that. And then there's doctrinal issues. Some Christians are premillennialists, like we, and others are amillennialists, like we are not. Some Christians believe the rapture will happen before the tribulation, while other Christians believe it will happen in the middle or the end. And there's even some Christians who believe there's not even a rapture. Some Christians lean toward Calvinistic doctrine while others lean more toward the Arminian side. Some Christians believe the gifts of the Holy Spirit are operational today, like we. But then there are other believers who believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased with the apostles and with the writing of the Bible. Some like contemporary music. Others like traditional music and hymns. And the list goes on and on and on. No, we may not be arguing about eating meat, though some of you are on some crazy special diets that I don't care to take part in. You're not doing those diets, though, for religious purposes to get close to God. Hopefully you don't think you're more spiritual because you're on a certain diet and other Christians aren't, because if you are, then you are a weak brother. Don't be judgmental when it comes to diet, because diet has nothing to do with your relationship with God. Okay? But though we're not in the church today really dividing over diets, you know, 
or yeah we you know we don't argue so much over special days but guys these things i just listed and more are the things that individual believers divide over churches divide over denominations divide over and it's really a shame it really is it was ray stedman who once said this the favorite indoor sport of christians is trying to change each other See, when we disagree with other believers in these gray areas, we are, not, we are not to try to change them to our way of thinking. But according to Paul, we are to accept them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Plainly put. A Jewish rabbi. Huh, you know where this is going, right? No, they, he was not there with a preacher sitting at a bar. No, they were not. Sorry. <laughs> Somebody felt that coming on, right? A Jewish rabbi and a pastor was at a, you know, no. But a Jewish rabbi and a Catholic priest met at the town's annual 4th of July picnic. They were old friends, and they began their usual banter. Dwayne, right? I, I banter with a few here in the congregation from time to time, right? But they began their usual banter. This baked ham is really delicious, the priest teased the rabbi. You really ought to try it. He says, I know it's against your religion, but I can't understand why such a wonderful food should be forbidden. You don't know what you're missing. You just haven't lived until you've tried Miss Hall's prized Virginia baked ham. Oh, yeah. Tell me, Rabbi, when are you going to break down and try it? Well, the rabbi looked at the priest with a big grin and he said, at your wedding. So the first principle that Paul gives us is that we must be willing to accept one another as brothers and sisters, regardless of our personal convictions, our personal opinions, and our differences. Do you get that one? Amen. The second principle is that we must be willing to stop judging each other. This is the second principle. Paul says, stop judging each other. I don't know if you know this or not, but one day, the famed Chicago preacher, D.L. Moody, went to London to meet the Prince of Preachers, C.H. Spurgeon. He had admired him from a distance and considered him to be his professional mentor. However, Spurgeon, when he answered the door, he did so with a cigar in his mouth. And Moody fell down back, or, I'm sorry, Moody fell down the stairs in shock. And he looked at Spurgeon and he said, how can you, a man of God, smoke that? Well, Spurgeon took the stogie out of his mouth, walked down the steps to where Moody was still standing in bewilderment, and putting his finger on Moody's rather rotund stomach, he smiled and said, the same way a man of God could be that fat. <laughs> be careful judging one another. You know the old saying, right? When you point your finger at someone else, that three coming right back at you. Look at verse three. Let him who eats, I'm sorry, Verse 3, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Now drop down to verse 10. Paul says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? Now notice that Paul accuses in these verses... Paul accuses the stronger brother of contempt and the weaker brother of judgment. See, the word despise in verse 3 literally means to treat as nothing, to treat as worthless. And the word judge here means to criticize. So the temptation for the stronger is to treat the weaker with contempt or disdain 
considering him worthless because of his lack of knowledge and confidence in the grace of God. And for the weaker to judge the stronger by criticizing him for his lack of holiness and apparent careless living. Guys, listen. Both extremes are akin to spiritual pride. In fact, another way to translate the word despise is to belittle. To belittle. But remember, to belittle is to be little. Never forget that. To be little is to be little. And that's why Paul goes on in verse 13 to say, Therefore, let us not judge one another any more. Paul's point here is quite clear. Quit judging other Christians with whom you disagree about peripheral issues. If it's not an issue of salvation and sin, stop quarreling with other Christians because they have different opinions, different beliefs, and look at the Bible different than you do. If they're truly born-again believers, receive them and stop judging them. Now, here's the question. Why should we stop judging one another as Christians? It is true. In the Bible, there are some judgments we do have to make concerning other believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul actually said it is the responsibility of Christians to judge one another when it comes to sin issues. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says you have no right to judge the person outside the church who's not a Christian, but the person who claims that he's a Christian has every right to be judged by his brothers and sisters when it comes to issues of salvation and sin. When you have a brother in the church or a sister in the church who is continuing in what the Bible clearly points out as sin before God, he is to be reprimanded, he is to be corrected, he's to be confronted and dealt with. And if he doesn't repent, Paul says, put him out of the church. Why? Because if he is continuing in sin in a certain area of his life and it's not dealt with, it will eventually permeate throughout the church. And everybody will think it's okay to do what this guy is doing when the Bible says no. So there is a place for Christians to judge Christians, but it's only on the basis of salvation and sin. It's not on the, ba it's, 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 it's not on the subjects of gray areas, see? And that's important to understand. With what we're dealing with here and what Paul's dealing with here, when it comes to gray areas, non-essentials, peripheral issues, gray, gray areas, Paul says don't judge each other. And why shouldn't we judge each other? Paul gives us here two reasons. I want you to look at them. Number one, we are to stop judging other Christians because, number one, God is the one who is responsible for them, not you. Look at what Paul says in verse 4. Look at verse 4. Paul says, who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Even if you disagree with him, God can still make him stand. He can still have a relationship with God without you, your approval. You see the word servant here? The word servant literally means a household servant. And the master is the head of the house. The servant here is us, and the master is our Lord Jesus. When it comes to issues of conscience, personal conviction, peripheral issues, we don't answer to each other. We answer to our Lord and Him only. Amen. See, if the Christian with whom you disagree, I'm sorry, if that Christian with whom you disagree is wrong about something that's essential, then God will correct him if he needs to be corrected. Is that not true? Yeah. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that God chastises his own children. God corrects his own children. But here's the, here's the real issue, guys. If you disagree with another Christian and it's not about a real issue, then guess what? Or if it's not about a salvation or a sin issue, it's about a gray area, it's really none of your business. It's really none of your business. 
In fact, there's an interesting illustration of this truth, of this truth given to us in John chapter 21. Do you remember in John chapter 21, Jesus came to Peter after his resurrection at the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus had restored Peter to his place as an apostle. Remember, Peter had denied Jesus three times. So, Peter, so Jesus came to Peter and asked Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Finally, the third time, Peter's like, you know I love you. <laughs> you know, what more do I need to say or do? And then Jesus said, here's what you need to do if you truly love me. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. In other words, do what I tell you to do. See? And what happened is in John 21, Jesus had restored Peter to his place as an apostle, told him then that he was going to die as a martyr, and then once again told him, follow me. Jesus and Peter get up from that place, and they start to walk. Peter begins again to follow Christ. But in John 21, we're told... Peter then heard someone walking behind him. He turns around, and guess who he finds? It was the Apostle John who was following behind them. And then Peter looks at Jesus and said this. Right after he's been told what to do and how he's going to die and just to follow him anyway, Peter looks at Jesus and says, I know I'm going to die as a martyr in the future, but what about him? Remember that? Yeah, he said, what about this man? And Jesus replied, if I let John live until I return, what's that to you? You follow me. In other words, Peter, you just make sure you obey what I tell you to do and let me worry about John. Amen. You see that? Very interesting. And number two, number two, we are to stop judging our brothers and sisters in Christ Simply because one day, God will judge them. God will judge them. He don't need your help. In fact, you guys know Hebrews 9.27, right? Hebrews 9.27 says this. It's appointed for man to die once, and then after this what? Judgment. The judgment. Someone once observed this. They said that God himself does not propose to judge a man until he is dead. So why should we? Amen. Hmm. Look at verses 10 through 12. Look at verse 10 in your Bible. Paul writes and says, But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. That's a quote from Isaiah that Paul actually quotes in Philippians chapter 2 concerning Jesus. And in verse 12, look what Paul writes. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Listen, whatever we choose to do or not do, it ought to be with the realization that one day we are going to be judged by God. Now, the judgment seat of Christ that Paul mentions in verse 10 is not a judgment of condemnation determining whether or not you go to heaven or hell. If you're truly a Christian, that's already been settled by our faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross Amen. and through his resurrection, see? This judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, isn't a judgment of condemnation. It's a judgment of commendation or a judgment of rewards. This is where every believer stands before Christ to receive a reward for what he has done for Christ, see? In fact, the Greek word translated judgment seat here, see your Bible where it says judgment seat? The Greek word translated judgment seat is the word bema. And it refers to the place where the judges stood during athletic events, especially during the ancient Olympics. If during the games a judge saw an athlete break the rules, they immediately disqualified them. And at the end of the competitions, it was the judges who gave out the rewards to those who participated and who placed in the competition. See? That's what the judgment seat of Christ is. It's where we receive our rewards from our judge, who is our Lord Jesus. Paul gave another description of this judgment in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10, when he said this. 
For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? That each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. There's another reference to this judgment in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There Paul explains that all our works will be tested with fire and whatever remains we will receive a reward for. And if nothing remains after all of our works are tested by fire, then at least our soul will be saved. Amen. See, if you're at the judgment seat of Christ, that takes place in heaven. So it's proof that you're saved. But it's not proof that you're going to get a reward. That depends on what you do for him here and now. See? That's the, that's the judgment Paul's talking about here. So again, Paul says in verse 12, notice, each of us shall give account of himself to God. This is why we shouldn't judge each other when it comes to gray matters. Matters that aren't dealt with, with book, chapter, and verse. Guys, give each other grace. Because every one of us are going to stand before Jesus to be judged. But in verse 12, notice that Paul didn't say that we will stand in judgment before one another to give an account of ourselves, does he? No. But rather he says that we will stand before Christ to give an account for ourselves. Now why will we stand before Jesus Christ on the day of judgment? We will because in John chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus said this. He said, For the Father judges no one. God the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Now, why in the world has God the Father handed all judgment of all people over to the second person of the Trinity, over to the God-man, Jesus? Why did he do that? Well, he did that because in Romans 8.34, Paul tells us this. He says, it was Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Amen. And in Romans 8, in that section, Paul says, he is the one who does the condemning, Jesus. And why? Jesus is the only one who can condemn people of sin because he's the one who died for those sins. That's the point, that's the point. Since Jesus is the one who died for us, he's the only one qualified to judge us. If you've ever sinned in your life, which newsflash, you have, you have no right to judge anybody else. You're not perfect. Your standards are way too low. But Je Jesus is perfect. But he came to earth, he lived the perfect life, and then took that perfect life and offered us a sacrificial death for the covering of our sins so we could be forgiven. You see that? That's why he's the one who gets to judge those who either reject his offer of salvation or those who say they're believers and sin against him. Guys, listen. Jesus knows all that we have done. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, it's interesting because what you see in those two chapters, once to each of the seven churches, now you do the math, how many times is that? Seven. Seven, seven times in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, once to each of the seven churches, Jesus said this, I know your works. You know what he's saying? I know everything you have done. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus said this. I want you to listen. Jesus said, and all the churches shall know that I am he who, listen, he is he who searches the minds and the hearts. Which one of us know what's in the mind or the heart of any, any other person here? None of us. It's interesting, isn't it, when we judge people? We usually judge people by their actions. But when it comes to judging ourselves, we usually judge ourselves by our intentions. Well, I know you meant to do what you did, but I didn't mean to do what I did. That wasn't my intention. See, we don't know each other's motives because we can't see each other's minds and hearts, but Jesus can. And on the day he judges every believer, he will judge not only our works, but even our motivation for why we did what we did. Amen. 
Wow, that's incredible, isn't it? And he goes on to say, Jesus says, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. He's speaking to Christians here. This is the judgment seat of Christ. So we are to stop judging our brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because one day God will judge them. Just leave it to him, okay? He does a better job. And finally, the third principle that Paul gives us is that we must be willing to allow one another to live their lives according to their own conscience. Did you get that? This is the third principle Paul gives us here about how we can get along with one another when we have differences over gray areas. We must be willing to allow one another to live their lives according to their own conscience. Look at the end of verse 5, and we'll read through verse 9. First of all, in the end of verse 5, Paul says this, Let each be fully convinced, where? In his own mind. In his own mind. In other words, every Christian should have no doubt concerning what is right and what is wrong for themselves. Okay? Listen, before you take that drink of wine, before you go to that movie or do whatever it is you're wanting to do, ask yourself this question. Is there anything inside me that says to me this isn't right? Because if it does, then you're not convinced totally in your mind that that's allowable for you to do, so you shouldn't do it. That's what Paul's saying here. See? If you go ahead and do those things that you're, not, that you're feeling uneasy about, and you go ahead and do it anyway, what will happen is, is you'll violate your conscience. You'll violate your conscience. And you don't want to do that. Listen, the conscience is an internal alarm system that God has built in to the mind and the heart of every person. And according to Romans chapter 2, verse 15, our conscience, it's our conscience, listen. It's not only the Holy Spirit, but it's our conscience that causes our thoughts to excuse us when we do what's right. When we do what's right, and our conscience isn't bothered by it, the alarm doesn't go off. See? But the conscience also, according to Romans 2.15, accuses us when we do wrong. You know it is that still small voice that when you're about to do something wrong, you feel like this just isn't right and I shouldn't do this. And then after you do it, you're like, I know that wasn't right because I feel bad now. That's your conscience. But listen, guys, when you ignore or violate your conscience and go ahead and do whatever it is that inside you didn't feel right about, you can harden. And Paul says you can even sear your conscience to the point where eventually you can't feel anything any longer. All of a sudden, you can do things that used to bother you, don't bother you anymore. Why? Because you violated your conscience over and over and over. You've hardened your heart, you've hardened your conscience, and you've seared yourself to the point to where just about anything now is allowable to you, even sin. And that's not a good place to be as a believer. The conscience is kind of like a fire alarm. You, you, you all have smoke alarms in your house, right? Yeah, our conscience is kind of like a smoke alarm. Have you ever had your smoke alarm to go off? The batteries in the smoke alarm, you had the smoke alarm to go off when there's absolutely no fire whatsoever, there's no smoke, and it gets on your nerves. Or you have those who cook in your house that tend to make smoke. And you get so tired of hearing the smoke alarm go off. And why do we always put the smoke alarm somewhere where we have to have a ladder to reach them? I mean, why are smoke alarms eye level where we can just go, ch -ch -ch, you know what I'm saying? Every time a smoke alarm goes off, it's always like, oh gosh, who's going to go get the ladder and do, deal with this? You know what I'm saying? But have you ever had your smoke alarm go off so often you're just like, I'm so tired of this, and you take the battery out. And you forget to put it back in 
Or you forget to change your battery every fall and spring, right? Just a friendly reminder from Calvary Chapel Festus. But you forget to put the new battery in, put your smoke alarm back up, and when there's a fire and you're in danger, guess what? You don't know it because the smoke alarm didn't go off and tell you that there was a problem. See? So, if your smoke alarm doesn't work, you can be in danger of burning up. And that's why it's important for you not to violate your conscience. Because your conscience is that built-in smoke alarm that tells you, hey, you're getting too close to fire here. Stay away. Your conscience will aid you in knowing what is right and what is wrong. And how do I know if my conscience is reliable? Because some people have just lived such a life of sin that nothing bothers their conscience. How do I know if my conscience is reliable? Well, Paul goes on in verse 6. Look at verse 6. He says, He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, he eats to the Lord. For he gives God thanks. And the one who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. What? Yeah. Listen, this is how our consciences are tested. If my conscience is guiding me correctly, then whatever my conscience will allow will be something that I will be able to do as to the Lord. You see that? If my conscience is working as it should, then whatever my conscience allows me to do should be something that I can do as to the Lord. That's how you know if your conscience is working correctly or not. That's how you test it. The things my conscience will allow me to do, can I do these things as to the Lord? That's Paul's point here. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he said this. He said, therefore, whether you eat or drink, does that sound familiar? Or whatever you do, he says, do all to the glory of God. Amen. Listen, guys, whatever we can't do to the glory of God, we should not do. So that's one way you know whether or not an activity that is not dealt with in the Bible, in book, chapter, and verse... That's how you know that activity is permissible for you, or, for you or not. Why? Can I do this to the glory of God? Now, real quick, we're about to end, but let me tell you. One day, Charles Spurgeon, remember I told you about him earlier? One of the greatest preachers and teachers of the Bible in church history, but he smoked cigars. We'll talk more about that next week. He smoked cigars. A lot of people had a problem with that. One day, he lit a cigar up, and the guy looked at him and says, how are, you, how are you going to smoke that as a Christian? He said this, to the glory of God. <laughs> it didn't bother his conscience to smoke a cigar, so he did. See, whatever you do, you must be able to do it to the glory of God, or you should not do it. Verse 7, look at verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to who? And if we die, we die to who? Lord. To the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, he says we are who? We belong to the Lord. Every one of you belong to the Lord if you're a Christian. Do you see that? He's your master. He's your judge. Not your brother and sister. In verse 9, he says, For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he, not you, <laughs> that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Guys, listen. Christ died to free us and to deliver us from judgment, didn't he? Didn't he? Yeah. yeah. So why are we judging each other? See, he alone is our judge. For any believer to claim the authority to tell other Christians how they should think and act 
in matters of opinion is actually to usurp the position that Christ alone holds. Don't try to be God in, in your brother's life. Stop judging. Don't do that. Because when you do that, you're taking the place of Christ in their life. It's best if you just let Jesus send the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit deal with them. See? Listen, don't try to fill those shoes. Don't try to fill the shoes of Jesus. Jesus warned us of what would happen if we did. In Matthew chapter 7, in verse, verses 1 and 2. Right? Usually, usually Matthew 7, 1 is every unbeliever's favorite verse. Judge not, lest you be judged, right? Well, this morning as Christians, let's put that one on. See? If you try to judge your brother and take the place of Christ in his life, and you try to judge him and tell him how he should act and how he should think, then here's what Jesus says to you and to me. He says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Doesn't that verse just make you kind of want to give a little grace to each other? See, so many times... We cry justice for everybody else. But we want mercy for ourselves. See, it shouldn't be that way. When I've done wrong, I love it when God forgives me. When I've truly sinned against my brother and I ask for him to forgive me, I love it when he shows me grace and says, you're forgiven, don't worry about it. I love that. But you're not going to get that if you don't give it. Because Jesus says, however you judge others, at the judgment seat, he says, I'm going to judge you by that same standard. That makes me want to start showing a little more grace to people, don't you? Amen. Listen, it's been rightly said, we as Christians are called to be witnesses, not judges. We're called to be witnesses not judges. So guys, listen. Let's follow Paul's advice here in Romans 14. And let's put up with our differences by accepting one another, by not judging one another, but rather by allowing one another to live their lives as to the Lord according to their own conscience. Amen. If we will do that, we will all become Strong brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Father, thank you so much for not leaving it up to us 